Yes. Oh, sorry. Good. Um, so first of all, um, well, that's a nice first. That's me. Okay, but uh, first of all, uh, I would thank the organizers for their invitation to talk. And I must say, it's a really pleasure. This is my first travel after the pandemic. And it's really a pleasure to be here and see real life people instead of looking to your laptop and see uh, everything online. So I'm, I'm really happy uh, that uh, hopefully this will be the first of many more workshops uh, to come. So um, yeah, my title is slightly changed in the sense that I will talk about the Bosoni case only, and I forgot to change it. And Johannes, he will talk uh, after this talk about the supersymmetric case, I extra subtly there. So I will talk about um, how to get the, the low energy part of the Bosoni thing here, in order to basically with very short and very short gravity. Let's keep jumping. Um, just a second. It doesn't react. Or oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, usually, uh, all, many of these talks they start with what we call the Bronstein cube to give you a little of a motivation that uh, you start here at the bottom with the classical mechanics, and there are three ways to add a constant of nature: either the velocity of light going to special relativity. Or quantizing uh, h bar by uh, getting quantum mechanics, or you add g nu to constant, you get a gravity. And then that's one constant. You can also add two constants. And if you go to the other side of the cube, then the ultimate thing is the one with three constants of nature, and that's quantum gravity. And often, we know that it's difficult uh, to, to, to describe, but often if you try to solve this issue of quantum gravity, you either approach it from the point of general activity, we try to quantize gravity, or we try to describe quantum field theory in curved space. And but you see, there's some sort of missing word that's here on the Bronson cube. But that's if you would try to approach from this point, where you have a theory which is uh, quantum gravity, but not yet made relativistic. And then you could go like this. And the question is, does this exist? And if so, is it then related to non relativistic string theory? And that, that leads to interesting questions. Then we combine, first of all, if you try to solve quantum gravity, do you really need relativity? Is it essential? Uh, that is a question that you have to try to answer. Uh, and then is non relativistic string theory a possible candidate of non relativistic quantum gravity? And if it all works and exists, could you even then work out maybe a non relativistic version of holographic, of holographic principle where in this space time itself you also have a non relativistic gravity? And you're not looking to solutions of general activity with non relativistic uh, asymmetries. Now, I will not give many references in this talk, but uh, I will concentrate on this talk on getting the things by taking limits. But there's also a whole literature where people try to get uh, results on all of the string theory with null reductions, and I've given you some names. And also, in my talk, the, the world sheet of the non relativistic state will remain relativistic, but it's only the space-time which is not relativistic. If you also make the world sheet non-relativistic, you get really, you can't do the usual calculations, and you get, you get really a different uh, discussion, which I will not do in this talk. So the organization of this talk is first, I will discuss, because uh, that will be my technique, non relativistic limits, how do we define them? And then I will apply it on string theory, and we get the signal of non relativistic string theory. And the really new result is that we can take the limit also immediately in universal to universal gravity. And it's rather subtle, I will show, but we have it. And then the honest will show that the, the extra subtleties which occur if you introduce supersymmetry are also solved. That's our recent work. And then I will give some outlook. So, first the limits. Now, if you, do, if you take a limit, is the, the rule is that you take the, 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 the relativistic fields, you rewrite them into is there a redefinition in other fields? Like for instance, the V-bar, you, you, you decompose the, 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 the dimensions, the flat index, which they call a hat into time and space, a prime space. And that's just a redefinition, and nothing else, it's still relativistic. And after you do that, you take the limit C to infinity, and then you get your non-relativistic theory. What is important is that the redefinition is invertible. So you already see that if I only would take the fields of gravity, I would induce three, I would induce too many fields. So that you can do if you do an expansion. That's also Niels made some remarks about the distinction between a limit and expansion. If you have an expansion, you can do that. But if you take a limit, this already is inconsistent with taking a limit. So I really need this extra field and decompose that. And then I have as many fields I introduce in this redefinition as I have. It's invertible. You can take the limit. The physical interpretation of this field is really has to do with the neutral current uh, related to the conservation of particles minus antiparticles. And indeed, if you take the limit, let's say, of a Clangordian uh, field theory, you really need that to couple the Clangordian field to this M, otherwise it doesn't work. That's also why it has to be a complex field, otherwise you don't get the Schroeder equation. So this M, that's it, it, we know now, this, this little M will become the central charge, that's the U1, which plays a very important role in the Schroeder equation. 
The important thing is that already here, you see things blow up, the metric blows up, you think that's bad. But you see, you, you should not worry too much about divergences. The only thing you should worry about is in fine answer that it's fine. So in this case, for instance, if you couple the particle to relativity, then there's an interesting cancellation because this infinity appearing here cancels against this and this couples to the particle via this minimum term. And there's also infinity here, and they cancel. But it, it's important. It's a, so it's a critical limit you take there. Infinities cancel. And they get a nice little particle coupled to normal physicality. But if you consider that there is no spin connection, if you, if you plug this in, in the spin connection, you get again a divergence. And then people get nervous. They don't like it. And what they say then, particularly in some sense, they say, well, because the divergence is proportional to this, this guy here, which John described as the zero torsion constraint, and they set the zero torsion equal to zero. And so showing this talk, this is not necessary, it's too quick, because as I said, the only thing I want to not to blow up is the final action or the final equations of motions, not a separate metric or a spin connection. And you can evoke this, that's one of the things we saw, but you have to include extra matter with the relativity. But in theory, it has extra matter, and I will, use, I will make use of that. But if you import this constraint, then you get standard new return gravity. You plug it in, in the, so this also means there's no action because this doesn't follow from an action. But you use it in equations motions, and then you get standard equations motions of new return gravity, and the new potential turns out to be hidden in the vector component of this M. That's how the, the particle also couples to the new potential. Now, um, Short with this because Jan already did it, but why people like this torsion constraint is because it really gives you the 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 um, uh, the foliation of space time. Because uh, if you see space time as this bread, then it, it's foliated. So every slice of bread has all events at a given time. So if you have an observer going from one slice of bread to the other slice of bread, the tau is the clock. But since tau is the d of the row, if you integrate over the clock, you get an the derivative, so it only depends on the boundary terms. It depends only on from which slice of bread to another slice of bread you went, but independent of the path. And that's what we call absolute time. The thing that really distinguishes this from relativity is that you see this is gauge invariant by itself. So there are in this story there are terms linear in the derivative of the gravitational field, which are gauge invariant. That doesn't happen in relativity because if you take the derivative of the metric, you get the affine connection. It's not gauge invariant, and that's why you can do all these things. And that's why also you see here that this the tau by the way that takes place here of, of torsion. This is a kind of torsion you can't have in relativity because this would not be gauge invariant, but you can have it in this case, and that's the torsion also. Jan was talking about this morning. So that really is we can do this intrinsic torsion. It's different from the general torsion tensor you add in general activity. Now, if you extend this from particles to strings, then there's a problem because again, in the string action, you get an infinity. But you see, in the particle case, you cancel it by adding a vector field. And that vector field contains the new potential. But you can't get a vector to a string. So the only way to get a little infinity is you have to couple the string to a new form. And then there's an infinity that cancels the infinity with the kinetic term. So we have to replace the vector by a two form. But then we see, when I wrote this infinity to cancel the kinetic term, you see this is anti-symmetric. I can't do it if I have one tau. We need at least two taus. And that leads automatically to a co-dimension two foliation. So you have to replace the tau of the particle case to two taus. That only represents the two long two directions of the string uh, to, to this term. And then you get uh, this two-dimensional foliation. And note, the new the potential is now hidden in the two form. So it's very basic stuff. Right? If you ask yourself, can you couple Newtonian gravity to, let's say, a real life string, like a cosmic string, the answer is no, because the new potential is hidden in a vector, and the vector can't couple to the cosmic string. It's kind of co-dimension two foliation, because then the new potential is hidden in the two form, and you can couple the two form to the cosmic string. The vector goes the two form. That is the remind you if you go to the string. Basic variables, and there was some confusion in the early literature because we didn't really understand that. Is that in the particle case, we decompose the fields of relativity and this M into these fields containing the vector. But if you do the decomposition in the string case, you should never introduce this M. You should immediately decompose like that. If you, because we see we were accustomed to have this M occurred in the decomposition of the, of the gravitational fields. And then but if you do that, you get redundancy, you get Stuckerberg, and you get horrible, uh, unnecessary complications. So just replace the M by the two form, and then everything goes okay. And these are the fields of universe force and universe force gravity. And uh, that's how it goes. And then you take the limits. And as I said, the neutral potential is now hidden in the, the, the space-time component along to the string in its two form. And then, so that's, an, uh, so all you go to co-dimension one, co-dimension two, vector comes two form. And then you get what we call string, stringy gravity. 
So, and then you are ready to take the limit of the relativistic string theory, and then when it gave the answer, you can do it, put it in, in a curved background, without gel mills for the moment. And, but then some funny things happen, and this is the answer, because you see, where are the fields of this string of gravity? Well, first of all, the transfer sphere binds, they are just here in front of the kinetic term, as, as, as happens in the relativistic case. But the uh, longitudinal field binds, these stars, they are hidden in this, what usually would, this would be the tri bound, the, the, the three dimensional metric, but that you can solve for. And it turns out that this H, which usually is the, the, the metric of the world sheet, is a dependent thing. It is uh, completely is to pull back of these stars. So the longitudinal field binds, they couple to the string via here for this term. And then this is the, the, the analog of the Ramon Ramon potential. And this is the generalization of flat space time to this general background. And this was already done many years ago. And note that when we take this limit, I didn't care about spin connections, there are no spin connections, so there are no constraints. I have not, nothing like a zero torsion constraint. This limit I could take without imposing any constraint. The constraints will come later if I do the dynamics. So part of the equations of motion will give you constraints. But before I do that, no constraints. So I have a general proportional geometry, as Jan discussed in his talk. Now, there are some two surprises I have here. One surprise is that to make this boost invariant, if you take the limit, you just find that the two form it has its own gauge transformation, but also transforms under the boost. So it becomes part of the geometry, as Jan also stressed. And you see, what I want to stress is that for this to happen, it was important that there was a critical limit where two infinities cancelled. So in general, you see, it's a representation theory. You could say, what are the representations of a non-trace group with the Galilei or the Barton group here? Well, many of them are the limits of a relativistic representation. That's okay. But it's not in the literature that you also can take two relativistic representations, and then they work together, and they become one relativistic representation. And that's what happens here. So the G and the B, they know about each other. They transform the boots to each other. So if there would be no translation to divergences, then the metric would be one representation and the B would be a representation. But since an, they need each other because the divergence has to cancel, they become together a unified representation of the non-relativistic group. So B is really part of the geometry. It replaces this M. The other important property, we saw that the longitudinal field bind occurred via the metric of the world sheet. And we know for the string there is a dilatation variance. That means that there is a field missing. And indeed, well, the, the, the sigma model is invariant under the scale transformations, which is collaboration between tau and phi. That means, that's funny, because that means that there is one field missing the sigma model. So if you ever calculate the dynamics of beta functions, for instance, there is no beta function for this missing field. So there's somewhere a missing field equation. And this turns out to be very important. So the fact that we need this, this deal, without this dilatation symmetry, things would not work in the way I will tell you this talk. So remember that there's one missing equation of motion, and what is that missing equation of motion? So, well, I think that it's difficult because I was talk of this day trip. If I go too long, then uh, it's really, uh, I can never come back here anymore. So, uh, I hope I don't have any questions at this point. I hope I'm not going too quick. Because, but not then, uh, and how much do I have? In fact, just to get the half of the half the time, 50 minutes? Okay. So, so, the new thing is that we thought, well, uh, okay. Uh, of course, you can calculate the equations and functions of all the same field and calculate the beta functions that we've done, but then we also immediately understand that by taking the limit of relativity with an quantum field and a dilaton, and that we call nervous of inverse short gravity. And if you take the limit, then subtleties occur. It's not so easy. So if you take this action, and I, I skip now the dilaton because in this part of the story, it doesn't play an important role. It did play an important role for the dilatations, but to keep it simple, I only take the, the Einstein Hilbert and the, and the Paul Ramon kinetic term. And we put this expansion, eh? the, it, this is invertible, and I take the limit C to infinity. If you do that, then unfortunately, uh, there, are in, 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 there are divergences. So they, you can expand the action in, in quadratic divergence. This is the term you like, and these, uh, they go to zero of C to infinity. And this S2 effect is proportional to the, the, the coordination 2 uh, portion tensor. So the problem is just set to this zero, but as I told you, the SIG model was no need, so let's not do that. Because remember, in the SIG model, there was a critical cancellation between the kinetic term containing the metric and the resolute term containing the Kalper Moore field. So, on the one side, it's of course very logical, but this is what we didn't realize first, is that here the same thing happens, because if this case is an infinity, but the B field also gives you some geometry, could it be that the divergence coming from this term cancels the divergence from that term? And that's exactly what happens. So, in fact, there's one of the two miracles. The divergences arising from the kinetic term, the metric, and the two form in this kinetic term, they exactly cancel. 
So we can take the limit without imposing any geometric constraint. And, and that's really a surprise. It turns out that the final answer is invariant under local dilatations. You see, the sub model was already invariant under local dilatations. And you do a beta function calculation using that sub model, so it's reasonable that the action is also invariant under local dilatations, but it's not a God given fact. There is a guaranteed global dilatation, because if you expand this, then all the weights are determined by this expansion of C. That determines the gives global, the global weights. The fact that it's in fact a local dilatation, you really need a dilatation gauge field, and there is no dilatation gauge field, so it really will go in a way I'll explain later, but it's not guaranteed, but we find it, and it's very important, and it's something related to the string nature of what I'm doing. So, what's, so we, we take the, the limit, and this is the actually get. So roughly speaking, it's a kind of, you could say, the gravity part. This is the kinetic term of the calcul model. The opposite part refers to the transfer directions. The other components, they are hidden in the spin connection, because remember, it becomes geometry also. Yeah? So they need it, you need them to make nice spin connections. B is this dependent gauge that I will talk about. And this term is because, as I said, there are gauge invariant combinations of torsions, you know, like in generativity, which are gauge event, and they occur in the action. So this is the sole component of the torsion. In fact, this action has an emerging dilatation symmetry, and the B is like the gauge field, but it is dependent. I will give the expression later. It's, 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 you already mentioned it. It's an, an expression in terms of tau and phi. But the important thing is, it is event on the dilatations. That means that there is one missing field, and there is one missing equation of motion. Because if there is a missing field, there's no equation of motion. And let's first discuss the missing equation of motion. What is that equation of motion? Well, Unfortunately, it just happens exactly the one which we associate as the partial equation of the unit potential. So we want to get some Newtonian gravity, but there is no partial equation. But in some sense, that is, it makes sense because the, there is a folklore saying that there is no action principle for Newtonian gravity based on the bar in algebra. Remember, when we take the standard case of zero torsion, there was no action. So if this would have worked, we would have an action for Newton gravity with a bump in algebra. And uh, we, we, we think that doesn't exist. So, because of the dilatation, it is good because it is not a part of the action, it's a separate equation of motion. So, um, what happens, it's very nice, is that the whole thing, so you have an action giving rise to equation of motions, and you have a separate passing equation. Nevertheless, they are very friendly. Because you see, what you usually learn in, in classical mechanics, you have an action, it gives you all the equation motions. If the action has symmetries, the equation motions are symmetric. But this is a non-relativistic symmetry, which is, and here I quote the mathematical literature, it's reducible but undecomposable, which in human words means one does a two, but two doesn't go back to one. It's like a boost. You know, a relation boost is time goes to space, space goes to time. But a delay boost is hard rotation. So space goes to time, time doesn't go to space. Here yeah, it's the same thing. So the past equation, you, the, the fields that fall from the action, they don't go under a boost to the as usual. But the parcel in the boost is not invariant. It goes to the equation of motion of the action. So as long as the parcel equation doesn't fall from the action, it needs the action to be defined. Without the action, it would not be gauge invariant. So that's an example of the, these representations. It's a kind of funny thing, in fact, already interesting in classical mechanics, that you can have equations of motion that do not follow from action, but they, they need the action for their existence. But there is still one problem, because the local dilatation means there was also a missing field. But if it's a missing field, then, um, because you don't, you see, you, you, if, you, if you would take the limit of the original relativistic equations of motion, so you, you can either take the limit in action, then it varies, but you also can immediately vary and then take the limit, then you have third equations of motion. 10 minutes, yeah. But you see, if you lose one field and you keep the same number of equations of motions, there's a degeneracy. So some equation motion should somehow not get a linear response because all this is an over determinism. And that's exactly what happens because in this action, the Newton potential itself does occur, not the equation, but the, the, the field occurs. And that gives rise to a non-linear constraint on the geometry. This means that, uh, that, that, that this has not a linear part. So that means you lose also the equation in, in the sense of it, it, that it doesn't get overdetermined. And this is an example of a constraint you get after taking the limit just on the dynamics. If the limit doesn't require constraints, but part of the computer functions or doing the, the, the dynamics, you get constraints on the geometry as part of the dynamics. And then it comes in, it's consistent. It all um, uh, seems to work. But let me make some comments because this took some thinking. Um, now it doesn't react. Strange. Oh. So, you see, because there are several calculations you can do. Uh, you know, I have an action, I have equation motions, but also beta functions, and how does they compare? 
He has some magic for you. So, so concerning the action, there's a relativistic and a non-relativistic action. The equation of motion can take either of the relativistic action or non-relativistic action, and the beta function you can use the sigma model. And what happens is because of the dilatation, if you take the limit, if you take the, uh, the equations of motion that correspond to the non-relativistic action, I told you, you miss an equation of motion. That's the Poisson equation. That's the first line. But you, you have the non equation. That follows from the action. The funny thing is, if you count the beta functions, you also don't get the full story because there was a dilatation in fairness. And what you then get is you get the usual equation motion of the non-twist action, and you get the Poisson equation. But you miss the non equation. And only if you take the limit of the relativistic right. equation of motion, you get everything. Then you get the, the equation of the non-twist action plus the Poisson plus the non-linear. So the point is this non linear because it didn't follow from this beta function calculation. But this has been clarified in a very interesting way by Zig Young in a recent paper because I slightly cheated because when I gave the sigma model, there is a kind of more fundamental sigma model which contains a Lagrange multiplier. I didn't give it to just to not to do everything at the same time. And the answer is that what that was investigated by Zig Young that this model is non relativistic if, the, if that Lagrange applies, is that Lagrange would apply. But if you calculate the, 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 the quantum sigma model, the sigma model, then it could happen that you develop a problem with the dynamic and the Lagrange multiplier. And then it's not non relativistic anymore, it becomes relativistic. So there is the danger that the model becomes relativistic. However, the coefficient in front of this dangerous term is exactly that nonlinear constraint. So you could, it's more as you could say that's the beta function correspond to the Lagrange multiplier I forgot to talk about. And then everything works. Then, then you really get the nice consistent story, and everything is understood. Yeah, let me just be really quick here because uh, the, the final geometry is this partial string with guitar geometry. Jan was mentioning. So the basic variables are these two kind of vier binary, uh, parallel to the string, transfer to the string, to come from the dilaton. And the rest of the fields, all spin connections are dependent by imposing constraints, conventional constraints on these guys. So the funny thing is you not only impose conventional constraints on the gravitational field, but also this, the curvature of the Carpermont field. That also contains boots, so it contains a spin connection. If you set certain components to zero, you can solve for the omega. And that explains, remember, the action. I only had the, the, the curvature in the transverse directions. The other components are missing, but that's because they were set to zero by that conventional constraint, and they disappear. They become part of the definition of the spin connections. And the, the beam you also need the dilaton, it's needed for the local dilatations, and this is the expression for the dependent dilaton. So there's no, like in conformance to gravity, there would be a special conformal transformations. If you have an independent beam, then the, but, but this, that's not here. The whole beam is dependent, and there's not such some notion of special conformal dilatations. It's not that, uh, that so it's in that sense, it, is, it has inverse local dilatation, but you should not compare it like some conformal gravity thing. And then the defined connection, if you do this, this conditions with John discussed, you really get here torsion. And so the, 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 the funny thing is that, so this term usually is a conventional constraint. It's used to solve for omega and b. But the point is now that's special about this knowledge thing that if you take special projections of this, then the omega and b disappears. So there are combinations linear in the derivative of b tau, which are non-zero. And these are these intrinsic torsions. And that's why you have torsion. In the relativistic theory, this will never happen because they all disappear by conventional constraints. So, the outlook. Uh, first of all, so I found a nice trick to get um, um, uh, effect, uh, a nuclear time gravity by taking the limit in the action. No, you can't do this for the current new action because I need a limited matter. And the question is how general is it? Could you do it also? I did it for two forms. Can you do it also for vector fields and immediately get a particle light in nuclear gravity? Can you do it for three form fields? Um, well, uh, we have not given the answer, but uh, it's certainly true that there are other situations where you can cancel the infinities. That certainly is true. But what is less clear is that you also get an answer which is invariant on local dilatations. And that's important because that explains our result. So, because if you don't have events on local dilatations, then since I know that it can't contain the Newton uh, the equation, you get something which is maybe not just Newtonian gravity, it's something else. So, it, that's certainly not, not God given that you get local dilatations. And here it was somehow. Explained because it was a kind of string. Now, naturally, of course, next step would be to include Young Mills and to get the, the heterotic uh, gravity. Uh, that's interesting because it has extra subtleties because then, you know, you, you all remember that you, you have to introduce heterotic forms in the signal model and you get anomalies because you get the Young Mills to science form and that arises because of the anomaly in the world sheet. Uh, because the, the two forms are forming Young Mills and that is cancels the anomaly, this comes from the heterotic formions. And um, the other thing we did in our paper in the appendix, we gave the limit in flat space time of Young Mills. 
And then that's something very nice, uh, because in the whole answer there were too many affinities, you need some time, uh, rest, some core flow, and then afterwards you'll come back to it. So they will come a paper. But what we did, we took the limit in the flat space time, and then it works in a nice way, because you take a string limit of young mills, and then you reduce it uh, to one dimension lower, and they get exactly the answer, which you also would get if you would do another reduction. And that is the manifestation of T-duality. So what we get is consistent with T-duality. We mentioned T-duality shortly, but T-duality in this language really means that, that I would take a limit, a string limit, and reduce over a in the direction along the string, and it's the same thing as a null reduction immediately. And this is what we get consistent with T-duality, but we have not yet coupled this to, to the gravity thing. So we have not yet the normative version of the young mills uh, your science form, but of course it would be nice. We, we can do it, but it takes time. Also, I also thought maybe to mention that we discuss closed strings. There's a whole discussion about open strings. And for that, I recommend the lectures given by Ziggy Young at the first school on monitors quantum field theory, gravity, and geometry. You can find it on the website, and all the lectures have been recorded. He gave some live lectures on open strings. Concerning the connection to double field theory, I would like to mention that's very interesting, but I'm faced with one puzzle, and that is that that you see it's based on this null reduction. But what is confusing is that a null reduction is a constraint on the geometry, because say something is zero. And that means also you lose an action, you cannot do it in field equations. But in the in the supergravity case, so if you do it with supersymmetry, that that constraint is not invariant in the supersymmetry. So it leads to more constraints. And in fact, I've never seen a supergravity theory uh, with a null isometry direction or off shell. If I look at two solutions, uh, that, that's okay. But off shell, so uh, two minutes, yeah. So uh, that will be an interesting thing to see how it works, really. Uh, what is a null reduction for a supergravity theory? Yeah. Uh, so you discuss two extensions. One, the string extension, that's what I discussed in the talk, and then there's the supersymmetry extension. And that I leave to your audience, but I should say, it starts, will not be easy, because the problem is that I already showed you that we finish this in the action. And the action means equations of motion, for infinities. Supersymmetry is more or less the square root of the equations of motion. So you are bound to find infinities in the supersymmetry rules. But unfortunately, they are the square root of these infinities, and they have opposite duality, so they don't cancel. That's for sure. In fact, the most you can get is dual anti cell dual combinations. So your analysis is bound to end up with non vanishing infinities already in the supersymmetry rules. And to solve that, you should listen to his talk, but the nice thing is that the theory will give you the answer. We didn't find the answer. All we said is it must exist, and then we found some very special properties, as Johannes will explain, and it will work. But So it's certainly non-trivial to add supersymmetry. It's a very important thing. And finally, in my last 30 seconds, what I would like about this is that it seems that you, you get now a nice target space approach to normal risk string theory. Everything we did in the past in the relativistic case, you can do also at this normal logistic level. You can now look at the equation motions. We already did the current spin equations in our paper. Now you can look to brain solutions, supersymmetric brain solutions, compactifications, and even look to normal logistic deep brains, maybe normal logistic holography. And even if the answer is negative, it's all wrong, it doesn't work, then at least we can answer that question. And maybe we find some nice things. And then maybe on one of the next corporate workshops, you know, I will give a talk about uh, our further progress in North extreme theory. So at least it's fun to think about all these things, about limits, etc. I thank you for your attention. I have to stop. It was very interesting and clear talk. There's somebody giving me a question here. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yes, you. Mentioned in the beginning the um, uh, sheet geometry. Can you uh, the sheet geometry? What, what sheet geometry? Yeah, yeah. What geometry? The, the world sheet, yeah, the world sheet yeah. yeah. You said something about its geometry and the possibility of having the also the, the non-relativistic limit there. Can you make more? more no, what I said is that that the way uh, uh, Guri and the um, Romans uh, define their string theory was really by taking the way also John was discussing, was a limit in the target space, but preserving the relativistic symmetries on the world sheet. Because if you don't, because in, in that way, they did more than all the calculations you can do in the relativistic case. If you don't do that, you, then really the theory becomes exotic, because then you can't do these calculations. And people have looked to it, but then really, and there is some application, etc. but it becomes a completely different story. Then it's not really a standard string theory. That's why I didn't get into that, but certainly, you could do it, but we, we don't. So on the world sheet, we still have a, a relativistic uh, uh, world sheet. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, you mean if you generalize this to to brains, these limits? Yeah, I think it's right out of that yeah, well, this is different. I mean, certainly, people have thought about this uh, brain shift. There's even a paper where people try to literally limit of uh, the dimensional gravity. Then they would the membrane. But then the sick model, you can do that. And you get a similar cancellation, you get a brain. But what you don't have is, mind you, the, the local dilatations. Eh? So, what is not obvious is that you get something which is related to Newtonian gravity. There is a recent paper by Blair and other people where they take the limiting left dimension and they claim they get a nice answer. But it's not a God-given thing. But certainly, uh, I say also, you have to be careful because also in string theory, there are key brains. And so it's not the only limit you can take. But if you want to take it as a fundamental object, you only have to, let's say, the, the left dimension membrane, then certainly you have to take a membrane foliation. That, that's unavoidable to, to cancel the infinity. Yeah. But it's only for the string, the only key brain that gets in the form is for the string. The yeah, so there's no deal. Yeah. So it means that is an issue there for local dilatations, how you get it. And, uh, I think they say they don't get it, but, but it's not a God-given thing. So it would be interesting to see how it works. So how to it? Well, I don't know, because usually uh, you don't have it, and it, you only get part of the reduction. Um, so but I think uh, in the days that they had it, uh, well, if they would not have it, then, then really the, it would be strange, because then Newton Cotin would follow from action, which it seems to be not possible or on the part of algebra. They say they have it, but I don't know. All I can say is they say they have local limitations similarly. But uh, it will be interesting to see how it works, yeah. Because indeed, there is no dilaton. And also, the sigma model itself is no sigma. Uh, uh, also, there's no beta function calculation. So, the whole thing, all I'm saying is let's be careful if you go to these situations. In, in, uh, well, this is work I know that people read. There are two things. There is a paper by uh, Blair and, and, and collaborators, uh, Zinato, I think, and some people from Utrecht. And that is uh, within a year ago, more or less. There's also an interesting upcoming work by Zeke Jan, who does the SURD, goes from D2 brains to N2 brains, it tries to mimic these things. And that sounds also, but it's not yet published. All right, I just uh, took a quick look at the clock and I think okay, it's yeah, time. Thank you again. It's going to be by Johannes Landsteiner uh, on non non relativistic supergravity in 10 dimensions, unless you changed your title. I did not. All right. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yeah. All right. Um, so thank you to everybody who stayed until to, to uh, almost the end of this beautiful conference. And I which I massively enjoyed, and I think many of you did as well. So let me join many of the previous speakers to thank your organizers for putting all of this uh, together against all the odds and with all the difficulties that um, COVID restrictions um, impose. But so the talk um, will present a new supergravity multiplet in 10 dimensions which might sound surprising until I say that it's a non-relativistic uh, supergravity multiplet. And in that sense, it's part of a larger effort to understand and explore non-relativistic string theory. And of course, there have been talks by, by Eric and by Niels on Wednesday and by Jan this morning. Um, and you can see my talk is really the supersymmetric extension of what Eric has just presented. But I will try to kind of maybe um, make my talk complimentary. I will briefly review, but um, I hope uh, it is still very interesting. And I will discuss the kind of difficulties and extra complications you face if you introduce supersymmetry. Okay, so, so the whole thing is based on a, on a very recent paper um, that we did with Eric and Jan, and also Luca Romano and Jada Shimshek in, in Groningen. All right, so here's my overview. It's, it's very short, as you see, um, because I have a very simple message to convey. Um, I will start by some introduction and motivation and then briefly review some of the things that Eric has just discussed. I will not so much focus on the limit. I will try to basically just uh, explain and, and, and show the basic features of this theory and then um, really go to supergravity. Then, of course, end with um, summary and, and, and outlook. All right, so here I show something that you've seen now plenty of times, obviously, it's the Bronstein cube. Um, but I think it is a nice depiction of the general framework of uh, theoretical physics. 
and where quantum gravity in some sense is the pinnacle, the holy grail, if you want. And, um, and it helps me to kind of locate our research. It's, it's this far corner, the non-relativistic quantum gravity, which we think is an interesting alternative approach to relativistic quantum gravity. But the thing I want to add here is, is supersymmetry. And obviously, relativistically, in superstring theory, supersymmetry is a vital ingredient. So we ask ourselves, so what's the analogous role of supersymmetry uh, in the non-relativistic realm? Um, if you want a more applied um, motivation, you can think about holography. And of course, non-relativistic holography is a, is a uh, well-established subject. People have done lots of work over the last 10 or 15 years. But to my knowledge, at least, nobody has tried to build non-relativistic holography from the bottom up. And by that, I mean to mimic the decoupling argument by Maldacena in a non-relativistic string theory setting. And obviously, that's very ambitious. Uh, but we, we hope and we think that we made significant progress in that direction. But if you want more humble goals, then well, the first one is, of course, to understand non-relativistic supergravity in 10 dimensions. Um, what I will present today is kind of the minimal, the universal supergravity in 10 dimensions. But you can ask yourself, and I think it's a very natural question to ask, which kind of supergravities can you uh, look at in this non-relativistic setting? Is there also five supergravities and so on? Uh, and then obviously you want to understand how it relates to um, the dynamics of open and closed superstrings. So unfortunately, not much is known in, in that. So that's uh, very much an interesting question. And then um, beyond that, you, you can look into brain solutions. You can look at dualities between these, these supergravities. And as, as Eric has mentioned, whether there's a, there's a non-relativistic M theory. So I think all of these are very natural questions that you can ask. And um, yeah, uh, I'd like to add this disclaimer, even though maybe it's, it's clear by now that non-relativistic, when we talk about it, means Galilean type space-time symmetries. Because non-relativistic is, of course, a very um, vague title. But whenever I say non-relativistic, I mean space-time symmetries of that type. OK, here's a list of references that has been important for our work. It's, it's not a full list, obviously, but I think it gives a nice overview. Um, all right. So let me review some of the things that are important kind of in a purely bosonic setting. And the centerpiece is Gomezuguri string theory, which was first uh, proposed in, in, well, 20 years ago. So it's, a, it's an old uh, subject, but, but only very recently. You cannot see it here in 2018. Uh, Jaume Gomez and Eric and Siki Young uh, generalized that to, um, to curved space to nonlinear signal model. That looks like that in a convenient basis. And it's a, as, as Jan has also mentioned briefly, it's a unitary theory, it's UV complete. You can study its spectrum. Spectrum has non-relativistic dispersion relations. And it is an interesting thing to study on its own and, and it study its, its quantum properties. Um, but the most important thing that I want to mention here is, is that it couples to um, a non riemannian geometry. And again, for more differential geometry background, I refer you to Jan's talk in the morning. But, um, the fields that it couples to is a, are two one forms, tau mu plus minus, um, these what we call transversal field binder E mu A prime, a Carbramont field and a dilaton. And these tau mu plus minus, they are defined everywhere and they define a local foliation. So at every point on the manifold, you can split your tangent space into a kernel of these tau mu plus minus and the rest. So that's, that's what, what Niels meant. I, I like this formulation that the, the light cone folds open transversal to the string. OK. Um, and I will all, I, everything that I will say will build on these, uh, this geometric data. And of course, this foliation constraint that I just mentioned only makes sense if it's a gauge invariant statement. It wouldn't be in Lorentzian geometry, obviously. But here it is, because these tau mu a are invariant under, under string Galilei boosts. And uh, as has been mentioned by Jan and by Eric just now, uh, the price that you kind of have to pay is that the two form is no longer a math field, or, uh, but it's part of the geometry. It has this funny nonlinear transformation rule under boost. OK, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the basis on which I will build uh, supergravity. Um, one more short comment is that this, this theory can be obtained as a limit. The resulting theory is non-relativistic, hence we call this limit uh, a non-relativistic limit. Um, but interestingly, and um, is that Gomez and Uguri have also given a physical interpretation to this limit, and it was mentioned briefly by Jan, namely as an alpha prime to zero or an infinite tension limit. 
And usually that would, of course, give an empty theory. Um, but uh, Gomez and Guri choose a very critical scaling. So it's, it's this, if you look at this, um, these terms here, um, where you tune the, the Karl Bromo field to a critical value and thereby get a non-empty spectrum. So I think that's, that's an interesting feature. And uh, one thing that has not been mentioned today is that Chris Blair very recently showed that this whole limit and the, the whole theory is, is interesting when interpreted from the point of view of TT bar deformations. Okay, but um, having said that, um, Eric has just shown that you can kind of take this limit to um, effective target space description and thereby kind of write something like um, a low energy effective action and uh, an effective theory and thereby couple target space dynamics that you would get from wild anomaly cancellation calculations. And that is established by work with by, by Siki Yan and, and collaborators. And um, well, as Eric has just explained, so I will be short here, you, you take your usual NSNS gravity action and you take exactly the same limit. You find that there's very non-trivial non and subtle cancellations, but it gives you a well-defined theory. And uh, the theory is, has the symmetries that you expect, but on top of that, you have an accidental or an emergent local dilatations. So here it's accidental, but in a second it will become, uh, we, I will present a somewhat more systematic understanding in the context of supergravity. Okay, so I will, basically what I will say from now on will be a supersymmetric extension of the situation here. Okay, um, let me briefly say what I want to specify for supergravity. So, so as an example, let me give n equal one comma zero supergravity in 10 dimensions. Pure supergravity, so really the minimal thing you can do, where the bosonic fields are just um, the NSNS field, so a, a metric, a carbomor dilaton, and then I add fermionic degrees of freedom in the form of a graviton and a dilatino, both of which are uh, right uh, Majorana Bell spinners. And this theory realizes 16 supercharges, so the epsilon is a right handed Majorana Bell, hence the name 1,0. Uh, and then, of course, there's an algebra, uh, so these supersymmetries close uh, on shell. And then there's an action and equations of motion. But of course, you know that very well, but uh, I just showed it to, to, to highlight that I'm doing exactly the same thing here. So I will start with bosonic fields that are the ones that couple to the Gomezuguri string add a number of fermionic degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom will be the same as previously, but you see I, I introduced this funny notation plus and minus, which will become clear in a second. And this, again, this theory realizes 16 uh, supercharges, again, split into an epsilon plus and epsilon minus. But then for the question uh, of the algebra and the, the equations of motion and so on, uh, I will have to um, make a few comments, which really um, will introduce some funny properties of this theory, but I will get there. Um, right, so before I go there, let me briefly say something about what I mean by fermions in this context, because Often when I talk about this, I think people get confused and say, what do you even mean by fermions if you don't have a Lorentz algebra? Um, <clears throat> and ultimately it's very straightforward, but somewhat uh, technical. So I introduced Grassmann valued fields as, as you would, but somehow I, I, I introduced two fields, a chi plus and a chi minus, both of which are uh, my run about. Uh, but on top of that, I impose another constraint, which we call longitudinal chirality namely to have them be uh, eigenspinners of, of the gamma zero one um, uh, matrix with eigenvalues plus and minus one. Of course, it's just a choice that you can make. It's a projection, but it's very convenient because in this basis, um, Galilean boosts act in a, in a nice way, namely as follows. The chi plus is invariant on the Galilean boost. The chi minus isn't, but it goes to the chi plus. And of course, that's, that's a different boost representation uh, than what you know from relativistic fermions, but it's completely well defined. It's a, a normal representation. Um, it's it's kind of funny because you you cannot just uh, truncate away the chi minus, as you uh, which you might expect, but because the chi minus is is not invariant, so you kind of need both chi plus and chi minus to represent uh, the Galilean boosts faithfully. So this is again, as as Eric has mentioned, known as a um, a uh, reducible but indecomposable representation. And it pops up everywhere. It's a bit cumbersome to work with, but it's it's completely straightforward in yet. Okay, uh, but now let me get to the heart of the matter and um, present the supersymmetry rules. So this will be a very technical slide. 
uh, but it's uh, all I want to convey with this slide is that these these expressions are completely regular expressions in terms of the fields. So it's very much what you know from relativistic supergravity. Um, so you have regular expressions here. I don't give the full um, transformation rules of the fermions, but you can find it in the paper, and it's, it's nothing um, spectacular there or nothing uh, surprising. So that, well, you have Gravitini that transform as with a para uh, derivative of the parameter. And of course, you do want to study these if you want to look into um, Hilling spin equations and solutions. Okay, but having said that, the important question, um, in German we say the Gretchen Frage is, does that actually realize an algebra? Or does the algebra close on, on these fields? And the highly annoying answer is no. Um, and when we first found it out, we thought like, well, that's the end of the program. Um, there is no non-relativistic supergravity. But uh, I don't know, after some time, we picked ourselves up again and, and, and analyzed these obstructions to closing the algebra more, more carefully and found that actually you can lift uh, these obstructions by doing two things. First of all, by extending um, the symmetries of the theory. Again, I call them emergent, or you could say accidental or whatever. And then secondly, by imposing um, a set of uh, different uh, bosonic constraints. And both points are highly non-trivial in the sense that it's not clear at all whether they will be uh, consistent with supersymmetry, especially the second point. So if you, in supergravity, if you impose something bosonic, that's just asking for trouble because you, you would have to vary these constraints on the supersymmetry and thereby get a whole tower of constraints. But in this context, it turns out to be um, consistent and, and, and well behaved. So let me give, give you more details about that now. So first, these emergent shift symmetries. So among which are the dilatations that Eric has already mentioned. So here they, they kind of have a slightly different role to play. They kind of help you to close the algebra. But on top of that, we also, we also have two fermionic symmetries, S and T. We call them kind of an analogy to conformal supergravity. Um, we're not sure how far this analogy goes, and, but uh, well, that's, that's anyhow where the name comes from. And you see they, they transform some of the fermionic fields as shifts. I don't give all the rules here, but the important thing is that you have shift symmetries um, that emerge and that you have to include. And of course, that means you can might as well fix these shift symmetries, which means that you, you will end up with a shortened multiplet. And that very much came as a surprise to us, because you know in, super, in, in relativistic supergravity, there is such a thing as the smallest multiplet. And now you, you find that actually here you have a shorter multiplet. So that came as a surprise, but it's, it's well, it's what the theory tells us. And um, yeah, but even if you work on this shortened multiplet, you still don't close the algebra, but there's one more obstruction and you can lift this obstruction by imposing um, something on the geometry. It's a very simple constraint. You take the tau mu minus um, field that couples to the string and you impose this bosonic constraint. So that's not, there's no superspace or anything. It's a purely bosonic statement. And as I said, I mean, you usually imposing purely bosonic uh, constraint in supergravity is, is asking for trouble, but here it isn't because the time you minus turns out to be a supersymmetry singlet. Okay. So once you impose that, you close the algebra and, and everything is consistent. And uh, so these kinds of constraints are well known and it has been mentioned by, by Eric and by Jan in, in this context of non-relativistic geometry. It's known as a torsion constraint and it, it really literally constrains the internal torsion of, um, of the newton cartan structure. Okay, but that's the only torsion constraint we impose. Um, right. So let me uh, briefly summarize what I've said so far. Uh, I've introduced um, a minimal supergravity multiplet, where the bosonic fields are the ones that couple to the non-relativistic string. I added fermionic degrees of freedom. They realize a number of symmetries. Two of them are very much expected. Two of them are somewhat surprising, fermionic and, um, and bosonic. But these emergent or accidental symmetries, whatever you want to call them, mean that you're actually working with an effectively smaller multiplet. And then on top of that, you, you are required to impose this torsion constraint. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the multiplet, um, the things you want to know about it. But then you can ask, okay, that's nice, but can you really start um, describing some dynamics? Are there first and second order differential equations that deserve the name? equations of motion and is there an action? So let me address that. 
And here, the aim is, of course, to basically guess the beta functions of a associated um, superstring theory. Um, and the answer is yes, there's a set of uh, differential equations. Uh, well, Eric has shown part of them. I mean, it's just a list of equations there in the paper. But uh, the important thing is that this set of equations is closed under all the symmetries so that you, well, I mean, that's a, that's a natural requirement, obviously. And um, it took us a surprisingly long time to prove that and to establish that. And you might be surprised why, why that is, because usually you work with an invariant action, and then it's guaranteed that the, uh, that the Euler Lagrange equations are closed under the symmetries. But here, the annoying feature of these, um, well, one, uh, annoying feature of these theories is that you don't have an action from which these equations follows, follow as um, Euler Lagrange equations. Eric has mentioned it briefly. Um, it's not quite as bad, so and that's a bit confusing, but it's just well part of part of the deal that there is a subset of these equations. I call them bi now, which can be integrated into an action. So this action, this SNR is kind of a convenient mnemonic to, to remember parts of these equations. But the thing is, this, this functional is not invariant under supersymmetry, meaning that these equations bi are not closed under supersymmetry, which just points back to the fact that actually there's just this larger set xi, which contains both these bi and, and the m, um, which is really the, the proper set you should consider as, as equations of motion here. Either way, so this is a bit cumbersome, but we have a set of differential equations, which we conjecture to be reasonable beta functions for superstring theory. Um, and that's basically what you want in the end. Okay, um, I have one last, last slide before going to summary and conclusions, uh, namely that all of sets of far does follow from a limit. I just didn't mention it here, but, but I mean, all these things can be related to n equal one comma zero supergravity through a similar limit to what Eric has presented. Again, it's a very subtle limit. It's more subtle than what you do bosonically because you're faced with a number of divergencies that you have to control. But, um, well, that's explained in great detail in the paper, but somehow in, well, I, I chose to not present it in more detail. If you, well, if you want, I can say something in, in a coffee break. Um, well, the fermions are, are rescaled in that way, which is kind of very natural. Okay, so let me go to a summary and, and, and to an outlook. How much time do you have, do I have left? More than five minutes. More than five minutes, perfect. All right, so I have presented a new supergravity multiplet that is manifestly non Lorentzian. It is, to some degree, very much similar to what you know from relativistic supergravity, but it has uh, some surprises. Uh, first of all, that it's smaller than the smallest relativistic multiplet. And secondly, that it needs a bosonic constraint for consistency. And the equations of motion that we, we, we derived uh, are conjectured to capture uh, an interesting part of the, the target space constraints of non-relativistic superstring theory. Okay, um, now let me come to extensions. And there's one extension that very much uh, stands out for us, and it's, it's very much also work in progress. And that is to couple two super young nodes back to multiplets. And Eric has already mentioned it, that we, we have uh, flat space super, uh, super young mills multiplet that is under control. But for um, technical reasons, technical reasons that we don't fully understand, we, we so far haven't managed to couple it to supergravity. Uh, we're working on that. And I think it would be very interesting because once you have that, you can ask questions. Okay, I mean, classically, that's a consistent theory, but how about gauge and gravity um, anomalies? What kind of constraints do they impose on the gauge group and so on? Um, so I think that's a very natural and very important extension uh, on the way to something that serves the name non-relativistic heterotic supergravity. And then <clears throat> maybe on a, on a larger scale, um, I think it's very natural to ask, are there also maximal supergravity theories? Is there, is there a kind of a list of supergravities that you can consider in 10 dimensions? Is there an 11 dimensional supergravity? Um, so many of these Questions are seem straightforward, but um, I mean they throw up lots of, of surprises. And um, well, we 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 are we're looking into these things and hope to report on that. But uh, I think it's it's very natural and very interesting. And and of course, relatedly, you want to look into dualities. We have some good understanding of t duality, um, but uh, of course, it's interesting to also look into s duality and and, and u dualities. 
more directly, you can, I mean, you can take the results that I've presented and, and just look for solutions. You can uh, look for compactifications. You, uh, I haven't given the full details, but we have the killing spin equations. And um, solving them can be a bit cumbersome, again, because of this funny uh, boost representation. So you have some funny mixing between the, um, the supersymmetry parameters. But uh, in, in a paper with the NASIS from last year, we developed techniques to solve these in a slightly different context. But still, uh, we think that some of these techniques developed that could be useful. And of course, well, if you want to look for ADS-like solutions, uh, solutions with horizons, and so on. Anyhow, that's... Um, more or less all that I wanted to say. I hope to have given you a glimpse into, um, into non-relativistic supergravity and why it's interesting. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes, for this uh, interesting and clear talk. We have time for questions. Yes. Thank you for your very nice talk. I have a technical question. And when after introducing the non-relativistic string, uh -huh. you showed quickly a, a effective theory, the, the effective theory. And I'm wondering, which looked a bit like you you'd expect it normally. How is 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 that normally for a to for a string, you calculate the beta functions mm -hmm. and get get the effective action that way. That's at least one way. Is this how it was done here as well, or is it a quantum calculation or a beta yeah. calculation at least? Today? Yeah. So, so there's there's just there's a quantum calculation uh, mainly done by Siki Yan and collaborators. But well, as Eric has explained, we kind of try to. Uh, cheat our way into uh, the beta functions by, by looking at the supergravity description directly, or the, in this case, this, the gravity description. So, uh, well, we, we just yeah. take, yeah. So, so, I mean, this is just a relativistic one, and we take this non relativistic limit. And I mean, I don't give the expression for this SNR, but Eric has given it in his talk. But that's, that's the idea, yes, to kind of cheat your way into <laughs> the beta functions if you want. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions in the audience? Are there online questions? I don't see them either. Right, let's thank Johannes again. Yeah. Timing is going really well. Yeah. And we come to our final talk of the day and of the workshop. Rafael Mufato is going to talk about soft theorems and gyromagnetic ratio. I start because I know that I should be really sharp. So uh, I start thanking the. Okay, first, first I would like to thank the organizers for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to give uh, impressive talk after two years a talk in this uh, wonderful conference. And I'll uh, I'll want to show you in this in this talk some interesting relations that we have found between soft theorem and the geomagnetic factors. This talk is essentially based on three papers done in collaboration with these people. Verma, Mutenja Verma, which is a postdoc in Southampton. Natim Moyazza, that uh, the last time that I met him, he was in uh, Potsdam. And Massimo Taronna from um, Naples University. So, uh, what types of uh, soft theorem? I mean, I'll give a brief review of the subject for the people which, uh, doesn't, uh, which don't know anything about soft theory. The first, the first answer is uh, soft theory has an interesting relation satisfied by the gas matrix in the deep infrared region. To be more precise, soft theory, if you consider an amplitude with uh, an arbitrary number of particles covering uh, arbitrary momenta, Ki, I call this particle R particle, and uh, on, on this amplitude uh, you insert a massless particle carrying a low moment, uh, low or soft moment. You can see you can see that the amplitude factorizes in an R part, which is essentially the amplitude in the limit where uh, the the, the the momentum of the soft particle is soft, the amplitude is factorized in uh, an amplitude we to the soft particle, 
and a factor which contains all the contribution due to the, to the insertion of the salt particle. This contribution is a, a, is, is a, a series of uh, uh, in, in the momentum. And this series starts from one over Q, which is the, link, the leading order. One over Q because it's essentially a reminiscence of the of the propagator is changing between the massless particle and the endpoint amplitude. A subliminal term, which is order Q0, and a sub subliminal term. Okay, and this soft property are satisfied by many particles, by graviton, gauge boson, calbramon. For example, the first person that noticed uh, such factorization property for the photon was low in the, in the 50. We, we uh, proved that the leading, we discovered the leading term, which is a universal. Then, I think 10 years later, Weinberg extended the soft theorem for the graviton, computing the leading part. But recently, after a paper by uh, Stonger and Kazako, this soft theorem, especially for the graviton, has been extended to subleading order. And then many other papers have have also extended the soft theorem to the sub sub order for the graviton. Not all this order can be, lead, uh, can be universal. Universal means independent on the theory and on the, on, on the theory, essentially. For example, the leading part is universal for the, for the gauge boson, but uh, a paper by Erzbank has proved that the sub order is known, but it's gauge dependent. The graviton soft theorem is, uh, is universal up to subleading order. The sub sub are known but theory dependent. The problem one appears just a subleading order, it's an universal subleading order. This implies the fact that exists also soft theorem for scalar particles. In particular, there is a soft theorem for the, uh, I call this conformal field theory D, like on other words. The Goldson boson that emerge in, in conformal theory spontaneously broken. And this soft theorem uh, is universal up to sub subleading order for this conformal dilaton. And the reason because it's universal is because it's a consequence of the word identity of the conformal field theory spontaneously broken. But surprisingly, there is also a soft theorem for the dilaton, the, dil the usual dilaton of the, super of, the, of, of the string theory, gravitational theory. And this soft theorem is the same, this soft theorem is the same uh, it's been computed in bosonic, heterotic, uh, 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 superstring by doing a brute calculation. And you can see that it's uh, similar to the soft theorem of the conformal field theory dilaton. Uh, we don't know why there is a, this, uh, this is similarity between the two soft theorems. The universality is a consequence of the, of the symmetry of the theory. For example, you can prove that the soft theorem for the the soft theorem for the graviton, for the gauge boson, and for the calbramon are a consequence of the gauge symmetry. Uh, the soft theorem for the graviton, as Strong just uh, has proved uh, uh, in a very interesting paper, some Jack collaborators, is also a consequence of the word identity of the BMS symmetry. Uh, and the, uh, while the soft theorem for the conformal dilaton, as I said, told you, is, uh, is a consequence of the word identity of the conformal field theory is spontaneously broken, while the soft theorem for the, for the dilaton, so we have a, a soft theorem for the dilaton, which is quite similar to the soft theorem for the conformal field theory dilaton, both depend at the sub leading order on the generator of the dilatations, at the sub sub leading order on the generators of the special conformal transformations, they differ just, the two soft theorem differ at the sub-subleading sub, sub order just for eternals, but at the moment miss a symmetry principle that explain the soft theorem for the dilaton. So this is uh, an open question. So, the, of course, uh, as proved in the paper by Arcadia Med, uh, a collaborator, there are also uh, the, the symmetry of the theories 
of the theory are also so present in the double soft behavior of the master's particle. In particular, these people have proved that if you consider the double soft behavior of two boson bosons emerging after uh, in the breaking of a, a global symmetry, you can read from this behavior the algebra of the broken generator. We have extended also this, 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 this argument to the case of the conformal field theory dilaton. But due to these similarities between the Dilaton of the supergravity theory and the conformal field theory Dilaton, we have, we, have, we have motivated by this similarity, we have also computed, we have also tried to see what happened to the double soft behavior for the Dilaton particle. But in order to, to extend, to explore this interesting uh, connection between symmetries and soft theorem, we have also considered, for example, compatification of soft theorems, because in the compatification you generate, uh, uh, if you compatify the soft theorem for the graviton, you, you get at least three different kinds of soft theorem, the one for the, for the scalar, the vector, and again a soft theorem for the graviton. And by this compatification, we have, uh, uh, we have got a prediction on the geomagnetic factor of the Calusa Klein spin 2 masses. And then uh, we have uh, checked this prediction by the explicit calculation. In order to talk, the main ingredient that I will use are string amplitude. Now string amplitude, uh, we are interested not in some theory in string theory, but in field theory. The string amplitude are just a pool to treat these amplitudes, because the amplitudes uh, with an arbitrary number of uh, external state, usually in field theory, are very complicated because you have to sum many diagrams. In string theory, are compact object. Of course, at the end of the calculation, being interested in the result in field theory, we have performed, uh, we have to perform the field theory. Really. So, this is the plan of the talk, I have already said the plan of the talk about the bibliography. The bibliography is really a vast bibliography. But maybe if you give a, a look to this paper, to the biography of this paper, Stronger Lectures, and the paper that cited to this paper, you cover all, uh, all, the, all the bibliography on the subject. So let's start. So I start by discussing the soft theorem uh, computed by uh, considering two massless states in string theory. Master state means to graviton, to dilaton, and to calderamon in interaction with n hard n tachyons, which carry hard momentum. Why to consider bosonic string? For two reasons. This is because this calculation is really hard, because as we will see. Uh, and therefore, the amplitude with uh, this is the simplest amplitude that one can consider. However, this is just a warm up for uh, just a warm up for two reasons. First, because as you already seen in the case of a single soft photon this amplitude already captured all the main feature of the soft theorem. Furthermore, the bosonic amplitude is an ingredient of heterotic and superstring amplitudes. Therefore, this is just the first step uh, toward uh, a, a, a consistent, not consistent calculation. But then we have considered the, the considered the as, uh, have you, you said for the Tarkon a standard trick. Every time in the amplitude we appear a factor like this, we, we call this factor m squared. And we consider, if you, this is a standard trick, I think the first person that, uh, that did this standard trick was a shark in, this, in the 70s. So I think it's a real standard trick that we also use in the single soft theory. Every time in the amplitude appear this factor, you put m squared. And then you perform a, a, a limit where the string length alpha prime goes to zero, keeping this quantity fixed. In this way, the tachyon amplitude become a scalar amplitude. Therefore, in this approach, we will get soft theorem for massless uh, particles, these particles, in interaction with the scalar particles, so in this theory. Of course, at the end, we, we will have to compute the field theory limit of the amplitude because we are interested in field theory results, not in string theory results. But as we will see, this will not be necessary. So the string amplitude with the two tachyons and uh, uh, with n tachyons, uh, uh, two massless states already satisfy 
at level of integral and a sort of a factorization. This is a convolution integral between uh, an n-tachyon amplitude and a point that uh, collects all the dependence on the soft particle, dependence of particle. However, this is an integral, this amplitude, which depends on the punctures of the of the tachyon vertices, tachyon, the punctures are the, the, the places on the sheet where we insert the tachyon vertices. Therefore, these two integral, these two quantities are not are not disentangled. It's not the factorization property. This one. What do we have to do? We have to compute these two integrals on the word sheet, which is a really difficult calculation, and then. We have to hope that the result of the integration is an operator that acts on the n tachyon amplitude. Only if this happens, you can speak about soft prop uh, factorization properties for an n plus 2 amplitude. Okay, we have done this two integral, but of course, in the limit where the moment of the two masses particles are small, we have scaled the momentum by a small parameter. It was expanded in the in time on this small parameter. We have done this two integral at the leading order uh, one over tau square at the sub leading order one over tau. And, and we have got this expression, this operator. We have been able to write the result of the integral as an operator in that And this is the expression. This is an operator because, as you can see, yeah, there is the angular momentum operator, the tact and um, tact on amplitude. So, but this is not a factorization property for one particle. This has, these are many factorization properties because, of, of course, I can symmetrize with respect to all these indices. I, I subtract the Titan, uh, the Dilaton contribution, I get the, soft, the double soft behavior for the Dilaton. This, this result is already known. Sen a collaborator computed. It, it, the result that we got is an agreement with, with, with the same result. But we have also got soft factorization properties for the Calveramon. This is the result. Also mixed factorization property. And also a factorization property for the Dilaton. This is the, 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 the result. As you can see, here again, just the generator, of, for some reason, the generator of dilatations here. But we don't see any signal the appearance of another operator, so we don't see any algebra of some, some, some group. Therefore, this is not, uh, maybe because we stop the disorder of the expansion, we should continue in the soft expansion. Maybe there we could see information about eventually some symmetry which is broken. So from this calculation, we hope to have a signal of some symmetry that can explain the soft uh, dilaton theorem, but uh, we don't get further information. Okay, we have made, made many, many checks about this calculation. So then we know that dilaton emerge in the compactification, for example, over the graviton. When you compactify the graviton, you get the dilaton, the vectors, and also the, the uh, 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 another graviton. And so using the fact that the soft theorem is universal up to subling the world, therefore it's valid for any gravitational theory in, in dimension bigger than four. In the fourth dimension, this soft theorem gets also, also logarithmic correction. So in the bigger than four, these are up And so we are considering the soft graviton theorem and we are compatified it. So we start from D plus one dimension, we compatify one dimension in the circle. In this way, as I said before, we get uh, a, a D-dimensional graviton, a D-laton, and the vectors. And, and we need a precise relation. In order to get a precise soft theorem, we need a precise relation between the field the, the, the field the D plus one dimension and the fields in the dimension. And these are the relations. Now, of course, we can plug in this relation in the original soft theory, so in the original amplitude, and we get, uh, and we get three different kinds of the d-dimensional amplitude. One involving the graviton, another one involving a soft vector, another one involving a, a dilaton. Okay? Of course, from these three amplitudes, we can obtain the soft theorem. The one for the, the d-dimensional graviton is consistent with, with, uh, with the, the expected result. And this is expected because this is universal. Instead, for the vector, we have got this result. 
I think you can see is uh, the soft theorem contains or the vector contains three terms. Uh, these two terms depends on the counterclaim charge of the hard states. Therefore, they contribute only for the massive spin to particle. These terms instead depend only on the massless particle. And this operator is act on the massless states in this way. This action seems really, really strange, but you can check that this action is exactly the action of the broken generator, of, of, of the broken spin generator, the one which has one direction along the non-compact direction and the other direction along the, the, circle, the circle, okay? And we have che also checked this contribution by, by uh, direct calculation. We have taken on the market an amplitude that, that described the interaction between uh, graviton, dilaton, and back. So, and for this amplitude, we have computed all the possible diagrams that can contribute to this, uh, to this process. And we have got exactly the same result with a difference that we are able in the dimension to get this operator, but we are not able in the dimension to identify it with, with, uh, with the spin, uh, with this operator, because in the dimension, no, no, we don't have this operator. So, again, uh, this is a signal that you have. Uh, uh, in the soft theorem, this is a proof that in soft theorem, the, the symmetry eventually uh, broken uh, are, uh, are present there. So there is a still a connection between soft theorem and, uh, and the symmetry of the theory. In order to check these two terms, we have to, uh, these two terms appear uh, when we have as hard state the Kaluza clan uh, spin to particle. Therefore, we, in order to check that term, we have to consider a theory that describes this Kaluza clan spin to massive, massive particle. And this, spin is, and this theory is on the market. It's the first power of Lagrangian interaction with gauge field. If so you give a look to this Lagrangian, you can see that there is, uh, uh, it contains uh, a, a non-minimal coupling. Uh, which, uh, uh, which essentially the geomagnetic di fatto, uh, multiplied by non-arbitrary geomagnetic di fatto, you can see this theory. Inside this, theor this, this theory, we have computed all the possible diagrams that contributed to that soft uh, factor, and we have found the agreement if the geomagnetic factor of the spin to massive particle are equal to one. We were very surprised because if you open a book, you say that the natural value of the geomagnetic factor is two. But for this particle, it's a G equal to one. This is not a new result because in literature should have at least three papers that say essentially the same thing. Okay, this is also the soft theorem for the dilaton, but we don't gain anything. So in order to check uh, why we get G equal one and not G equal two, uh, 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 we, have we have made a direct calculation of the geomagnetic factor in, in, uh, for massive higher spin states. The theory which gave a consistent description of massive higher spin state are string theory. Therefore, in heterotic, in bosonic, and superstring theory, we have considered the role of bosonic superstring theory compactified on a generic toroidal background TD. And in the compactification, of course, uh, an large gauge field, because if I compactify the graviton, I get a gauge field, but also if I compactify the calbaramon, I get a, a gauge field. And therefore, we have, we have determined the geomagnetic factor of the massive like spin field with respect to these two different gauge fields. And we are used to two different approaches. In one approach, we have simply considered the, uh, the sigma model for bosonic, heterotic, and one one uh, supersymmetric signal model. In this signal model, we have computed the Hamiltonian, and, uh, 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 and the term of the Hamiltonian, which is linear to the uh, gauge field, contains information on the geomagnetic factors. And, but we have performed the same, the same calculation in another way. We have simply considered the, 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 a three-point amplitude of the mass state in interaction with the two generic higher spin field in string, in string theory. We have compactified the theory. And of course, if we uh, restrict our interest just on the gauge field that emerged from the compactification, you get from this three-point amplitude both the minimal and non-minimal 
amplitude. In both the case, from the, the, the sigma model from the amplitude, we get this, this result. We get this result, uh, which is of, uh, which is invariant in form for all the string models. So in heterotic, in bosonic, and in, uh, in, in superstring, we get the same expression, which is uh, only invariant in form because these are the left and right spin operator, which are clearly string dependent. This is how the bosonic string was derived by Russo and Safti. We have found the same expression, surprisingly, in heterotic and in superstring. Pilate, Pilate, this is uh, the minimal coupling okay, that you expect are universal, but these two terms is surprising that are the same in bosonic, heterotic, and superstring. These are the standard uh, left and right uh, momentum. So as you can see from this expression, for states uh, which have pi right equal minus pi left, or pi right equal pi left, therefore for either spin state which are charged only with respect to one of the gauge field, you can reconstruct the total moment, the, the total spin operator. And for these states, by computing the, the com computing the ratio between the minimal and non-minimal coupling, you can get the geomagnetic ratio. And the geomagnetic ratio for all these states are g equal to one. So not only for the Kaluza Klein states, but also for the winding states. Okay, one can also prove that uh, in the case of the Kaluza Klein, there is also uh, related to the unicity of gravitation uh, minimal coupling. But then having a general formula, which is valid for any higher spin states, we have extended the calculation to an arbitrary um, uh, Higher spin state with the mix of symmetry. And in particular, they consider it uh, higher spin state associated to this young tableau. For this state, it seems that we can define a geomagnetic factor for each row of the young tableau simply because each row coupled differently to the, to, 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 the, to the spin operator. And this formula is quite general because, as you can see, they just depend. On, on the length uh, of this uh, young tableau. So this is uh, a very uh, nice result, I think. So in conclusion, soft theorem are wind of the symmetry of the We have seen, because we have seen always the emergence in uh, the appearance in the soft theorem of, uh, of uh, the generator of some symmetry eventually broken. The fact that the single, uh, this, uh, the fact that we have similarities between the soft theorem for the conformal graviton and for the gravitational graviton is a still a mystery. Furthermore, we have seen that soft theorem make prediction geomagnetic factors. And this prediction has been also confirmed by such calculation. We have found a relation that at least in three theory, uh, from this uh, non minimal coupling, in three theories, uh, in total compactification, heterotic, bosonic, and superstring, this, this, three non, uh, this non first non minimal coupling seems uh, uh, universal in the theory. It would be nice to see uh, if this universality is kept by considering other compactification or before the, or string in curved background, like DS or RDS. So that's all. I think at the same time, so you can take the, the boat without any problem. Thank you very much for this. Great. Thank you, Rafaelo, for this interesting talk. We indeed have time for questions. Don't be afraid, we have five minutes extra. Well, I guess we want to go to a boat trip. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. I should also remind you. Are you going to say the same thing? Probably. I should remind you that Bohmwald colleague is starting tomorrow. Are you going to do this? Okay. All right. So uh, I, I like to give a very few uh, concluding remarks. Uh, one thing uh, Peter just said tomorrow they will start another event, the so called uh, Humboldt uh, colleague. It's about also questions in uh, quantum gravity and uh, fundamental physics. And um, I think everybody is invited to come here. The lectures start um, at 9 o'clock or 9.30 in the morning, uh, as usual. I do not quite remember whether it's 
nine, nine o'clock in this in this case, so uh, nine o'clock, so everybody is cordially invited. But the uh, other thing I wanted to say is that uh, it was very clear that we had a wonderful meeting here. Like for many others, I think it was the first uh, uh, in-person conference or workshop uh, after almost uh, two years, since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think therefore it was really a very special event and uh, I'm very grateful that uh, it was made possible uh, to uh, due to the enormous efforts of many people. So uh, with all these efforts, uh, I think it wasn't been possible to be here um, in particular during this time. So I think uh, a few months ago, it was even not clear that the event could have taken place, but I think all the, all the um, uh, measures, uh, there was a lot of caution and uh, I'm, uh, I'm quite confident, I'm very sure that I think uh, 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 it was really also in this respect a very successful uh, meeting. But in any case, uh, um, most importantly, we had uh, many, many excellent uh, talks by, uh, by many speakers here in the room and uh, also online from, uh, from uh, many, uh, many other places. So uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, of course, for their excellent presentations. And uh, more, uh, next, I'd like to thank the organizing, the scientific organizing committee for putting the program together, namely uh, Tamasis, Dimitris, Mariana, Alex, and uh, Richard. So we should give uh, them a big applause. And I think it's fair to say, to say again, many thanks to you, Tamaris, in particular. And then we had uh, several uh, very excellent local organizers, uh, Costas, Gregoris, Stratos, Stelios. So we should uh, thank them as well. I think without you, it would have been possible either. the importance of our uh, big boss, uh, uh, the importance of our uh, director. So uh, we'd like to thank you, George, for being here, putting all yeah. Yes, and uh, everybody, as uh, George is saying, is uh, invited to come back uh, next year, and I'm sure many of us will be here again. I'm pretty sure about this. Uh, but uh, finally, and I think maybe she's still the most important person, Iphigenia, and uh, she is really doing a wonderful job over many years. So uh, let's thank Iphigenia also. Uh, thank you, Iphigenia. I think uh, that's it. And uh, the boat, uh, the bus for the boat is departing at 1.30.